Hi everyone, thank you for joining um, and welcome to um, everything you want to know about poly dating. So my name is Leanne, um, I run a polyamory education page called Polyphilia, my handle's down here, um, and um, yeah, I'm polyamorous and I have been for a while now. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for me about polyamorous dating um, and how it's different from monogamous dating, you know, in terms of like logistics and stuff like that um, then just pop them in the comments and um, you know I will pick some to answer so a little bit more about me um, so I have been uh, openly uh, practicing non-monogamy for about eight years now um, I currently have multiple partners um, so I um, yeah, like I have a boyfriend, I have a partner, I have a couple of uh, other kind of casual partners, I have a queer platonic partner, um, and um, she's married, and we have, yeah, just like a really lovely polyamorous network. Um, and it took me a while to get to where I am now, um, but I really want to help you all um, kind of find, you know, your community and find kind of your own polycule networks. Um, and yeah, so feel free to ask me any questions questions you want about um, just dating more generally, you know, dating polyamorously, the logistics of uh, polyamorous dating. Um, I get a lot of questions around like what to do if you live with a partner or if your partner lives with someone, you know, stuff like that. Like let's get to um, just like the real kind of practical issues that you can run into when you are dating in a non-monogamous way. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, so also I will be here for an hour um, and afterwards I will also be answering more questions in um, the group chat for this live stream. So if you haven't joined it yet, I would highly recommend you download the field app and join it now. Uh, someone from the field team will be putting a link to the group chat, which is uh, inside the field app, um, you know, on in the in the in the chat now. So if you want to join the group chat and continue the discussion with me and other people, um, then yeah, join the group chat and we can talk further there. Um, so yeah, um, I'm already getting uh, some questions in, so let's get started. Um, there's a question from um, Adnan Samani, which is how do you maintain relationships uh, which are long distance in polyamory? Yeah, so I mean, this is um, the, like it, I think it highly depends on the person. Obviously, um, different people also handle long distance relationships in different way in, in different ways in monogamy, right? Um, but if both of you are committed to each other to make it work despite the distance, then you know um, that like. Uh, polyamory is a really great way to do that because you know there are certain need, certain needs that you can't have met when you're long distance that you can have met through other partners right um, and actually like my first long my first uh, non-monogamous relationship came out of a long distance relationship um, we were separated on different continents and I suggested opening up the relationship so that we could get uh, like sexual needs met um, I'm not with that partner anymore, but I do know that the long distance to polyamory pipeline is a very popular one. So, um, yeah, and it's very common for people to have long distance partners in polyamory because the community is so small. And so you might not be able to find partners locally, but you can find partners uh, on, on different in different parts of the world. And one of the things that I do like about the field app is that you can, um, you know, kind of choose like different uh, kind of like cities and hotspots to search from so you could connect with someone on the other side of the world and strike up a connection that way um so you know there's all that there's that flexibility um on field you know apart from just dating locally you can also date internationally or from like um you know like like the there's like a like a bunker like a fantasy bunker section like where um you know you can just kind of talk to people in that core so you know there's a lot of features that that are really helpful for maintain for creating and maintaining long distance connections um but in terms of kind of maintaining relationships that are long distance i think it's really important to set expectations right because both of you have lives you know both of you have other partners right how much time are you realistically able to give to each other? Um, and I feel like in monogamy, because you have just have the one partner, a lot of the time the expectation is that if you have free time, 
you know, like that free time automatically goes to the one partner that you have, right? Um, but when you have multiple partners, you have to be a lot more intentional about the time that you're spending with people. So you have to create these containers and you have to create very specific commitments with each of your partners so that they have some certainty on how much to expect from you on a consistent basis. So for example, you know, with um, one of my partners, we've agreed to see each other twice a week. So two days a week, you know, uh, guaranteed we will see each other unless, you know, there's exceptional circumstances. And if that happens, then we renegotiate. And with another partner, I see them, you know, once a week. Another partner, I see them like once every one or two months, depending on whether they're in town or not, you know. And, um, you know, we have the schedule, we keep it consistent. And so we know what to expect from each other. And we have that kind of consistency and commitment. And the same thing goes for long distance. Um, you know, if you live really far apart from each other and can't visit regularly, then how often are you going to text? How often are you going to video call? How do you feel about that? You know, are you going to be like, um, you know, video calling and doing kind of sexy things on there? Or are you going to keep kind of sexy things to in person whenever that is? If you do visit each other in person, how often would you like that to happen? And when that happens, how long would you, you know, like to kind of spend that time in person together for? Um, you know, and it, like, are there ways for you to um, get kind of sexual needs met while you're long distance, right? Like, can you keep it sexy through sexting? Can you do video calls? Can you use long distance sex toys, right? Like sex tech is getting better and better year on year. So there's a lot of technology out there that can help you even if you're in a long distance relationship. So, um, you know, uh, I think also, so, uh, like working on a project together, whether it's um, watching a TV show together that you discuss together, or, you know, doing an art project, or, you know, something like that, like something that both of you are committed to working on together, um, really helps to uh, create, you know, that container, um, where, yeah, you really enjoy each other's company, you're working towards something together, and you can get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of that shared goal or shared project. So, um, those are just kind of a couple of things that you can do to maintain a long distance uh, polyamorous relationships. And of course you need to be mindful of your own capacity, especially in relation to other partners and don't make promises that you can't keep. So uh, I hope that helps Adnan. Um, that's just a couple of things that come to mind when answering that question. Um, so uh, let's have a look. Do, 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 do. Um, so uh, Finn Richardson asks, uh, what are your opinions on a poly person dating non-poly people, i.e. casually with someone who considers themselves monogamous, but understands a casual relationship is not leading towards monogamy? This is a great question, Finn. Um, uh, it's a very hot day, so I need some water. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so my opinion on this has kind of changed um, over time. Um, so... Uh, basically, uh, a couple years back when I was uh, still quite new to non-monogamy, I was in a stage where I was happy to date monogamous people casually, um, but obviously if it came to romantic relationships, like I would only exclusively date people who were non-monogamous. Because, you know, most monogamous people want to date other monogamous people when it comes to romantic relationships, and most non-monogamous people want to date other non-monogamous people. Um, obviously, there are exceptions to this, but in limited circumstances, and I can get into that later. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think that, um, you know, if both parties understand that the relationship is casual, it's not moving towards anything serious or romantic or whatever, then, you know, a casual dynamic between the two of you could work extremely well. Um, but I think uh, one thing that I would say about dating someone who does eventually want monogamy when you're not wanting monogamy is that in the event that this person that you're dating finds someone else that they want to be in a monogamous relationship with, how are you going to feel about that? You know, like, are you happy to be, I guess, a kind of like placeholder partner, like, I guess, like until they find like their person or, um, you know, would that be a painful process for you? 
because some people they can really compartmentalize their emotions around that you know they're like yeah like i'm just here for fun you know when you get with someone else um then you know like i wish you well have a great time you know um <laughs> if you break up maybe we'll see each other again <laughs> like um but uh you know or some other people they might feel quite hurt or by it you know or feel a sense of injustice especially if the connection was quite good that like oh well just because you got into a relationship like now you know we can't like have you know do these fun and sexy things anymore that seems like a bit of shame um so i think it really depends on the individual and how you feel about it um i was okay with it for the first couple of years of being non-monogamous but over time it did get tiring um you know it did get tiring to emotionally invest you know, time and energy into a person only for them to drop me, you know, the moment that they found someone that they really wanted to be with. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the time when people get into monogamous relationships, you know, they're not, they're expected to not talk to the people that they had a sexual or romantic connection with before they got into the relationship. So even though I was like, hey, you know, if you get into a monogamous relationship, that's cool, you know, we can stay friends. A lot of the time that wouldn't happen often because the person that they ended up dating would end up being jealous and you know i've had people um you know stop talking to me block me on social media ignore me in the street pretend i didn't exist because they wanted to stay loyal you know to the new person that they were in a relationship with and that really sucked um and not everyone is comfortable dealing with that and you know as much as you can make these promises you know um like because like i expressed this very recently to someone who like eventually wanted a monogamous relationship i was like i really you know i only want to do this with you if you can promise me that even if you get into a relationship you know you're not gonna just like you know dump me like as a friend like i'm okay with us like not having a casual relationship anymore but if it but like if you know you're not even gonna be like friends with me uh, because like your partner gets uncomfortable or something, I'm not comfortable with someone else dictating like our friendship. And they were like, yeah, that makes sense, totally cool. And they did it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it's really hard to predict these things. Um, so yeah, like I think basically my answer to this question is it depends how thick your skin is. Um, you know, like if you are really genuinely okay with being a placeholder and having your relationship terminated or changed um, because they got into a relationship with someone else, then sure, you know, they, uh, like, you know, you can do what you want. Um, but there are the risks, right, that I've just expressed to you. And, you know, hurt emotions can come from that. Because the fact of the matter is, a lot of monogamous people don't see non monogamous people as, you know, like, yeah, like serious options. And they assume that like, just because things were casual, that like, you know, it won't mean anything to you if like, they just, you know, stop talking to you or something. And, you know, it's, it's a very different framework, fundamentally, from how non monogamous people do things. And yeah, different people have different opinions on this. But um, it did get tiring for me over time. And so now, even if I have like a casual relationship with someone, and I have no intent of escalating to romance with them, um, I only choose to date non monogamous people. But that's my personal preference. And depending on where you live, that might not be an option. Right. Um, but, you know, you have to ultimately be uh, just aware of, you know, kind of how you're feeling, I guess, like in your heart, how much you can take and how comfortable you are, you know, values wise with someone, you know, who is not in your relationship dictating your connection for you. Right. So, yeah, um, basically, in general, you know, do what you want, but proceed with caution for the reasons I listed above. Hope that helps. Um, so related to that question, um, and Anthony or Anthony Shelton asks, how do you suggest a non-monogamous person navigate dating and falling for someone monogamous? So uh, we're go going into like romantic territory here, whereas the previous question was specifically about what's your opinion on dating monogamous people casually, right? Whereas this question is more about like, yeah, romance. So like I said, most monogamous people want to date other monogamous people. Most non-monogamous people want to date other non-monogamous people. There are a very limited number of circumstances where a relationship between a monogamous and a non-monogamous person can work. Um, those are called monopoly relationships. Um, and uh, they are quite rare. 
um because as you can imagine right like it's it's yeah like you know it's it's a very different value system and a lot of people um really struggle to um kind of reconcile you know like their values being so different from their partners um yeah like i said most monogamous people want a monogamous partner um, most monogamous people find it very difficult to reconcile their monogamous beliefs with their polyamorous like actions right like as in you know i feel like monogamy is not so much defined by like having one partner but uh i think in mainstream in, in mainstream society it's often more defined by the fact that your partner is not seeing anyone else you know um and so you know like a lot of monogamous people um you know and i and i know this because loads of people have told me this Loads of monogamous people like like love the idea of having multiple partners, but they don't do it because they don't like the idea of their partners having other partners, right? So it's not about their own kind of choice to date one person. It's about like whatever their partner's doing. So if a, mono, a monogamous person dates a polyamorous person, they're doing the hardest bit of polyamory, which is seeing their partner dating other people um, while they themselves are not dating anyone. So it's kind of like, you know, just doing relationships on like major hard mode. Um, I think as well, um, because of the way that uh, we are kind of socialized to think that love is sacrifice and that, you know, we need to like compromise uh, for people's happiness and stuff like that. Some people take that too far and end up giving up their own desires and needs in the process of pleasing their partner. So unfortunately, um, I do find that, um, uh, you know, a lot of, not all, but a lot of monogamous people who are dating polyamorous people and non-monogamous people are not doing so because they genuinely feel that a polyamorous dynamic benefits them in some way, but because they're afraid of losing their partner and they give up their personal happiness and boundaries to maintain the relationship. And obviously, if you're not practicing your authentic desires and you're not setting kind of you know, boundaries like properly, this blows up long term, you know, it builds resentment, it builds contempt. Um, and, you know, it, it, yeah, it leads to some really difficult emotions in the relationship. So in general, I do advise against non-monogamous people dating monogamous people. Um, you know, in the, in like, there are some uh, monogamous people who are happy to date people who have other partners. Um, there are loads of reasons why someone might do that, right? Um, it could be, you know, like a monogamous person might want to date a non-monogamous person because they like having more free time to work on their own stuff, right? While their partner's seeing other people to see like family, friends, work, whatever. Maybe they uh, don't feel as much pressure to fulfill all of their partner's relationship needs and feel freedom in that, right? It could be that they gain value from like challenging their insecurities and growing as a person. And they feel like non-monogamy is a really great way of doing that you know, it could be a bunch of other things, but um, it must be about them, right? It's got to be about them and their own motivation to be in a non-monogamous relationship, despite, you know, practicing monogamy themselves. Um, if it's solely motivated by, I want to be with this person and I'm really terrified of losing them and I don't want things to change or I don't want things to end. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm just saying that it's a difficult dynamic to sustain because if you're not personally motivated to be non-monogamous, then you know, um, like a resentment has the potential to build up over time. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're falling for someone monogamous and that monogamous person, is, you know, genuinely wants monogamy, right? Like that is their authentic desire. That is their dream relationship. You know, how do you feel about asking someone to compromise like their dream for you know, their relationship, their most intimate connections, right? Like the, some of these most important connections in your life. How do you feel about that? And how do they feel about that? Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential complications there basically is, is what I'm saying. Um, again, it's not, it's not impossible. There, um, there's a really good account actually um, called Polyamoring. Um, and she's a woman who has been in a 12 year monopoly relationship. So she's the monogamous one. And yeah, her partner's polyamorous and they live together, you know, with you know her partner and her, her partner's other partner. So, you know, dynamics like that can work in a limited number of circumstances, but they do have a lot of risks long term if, you know, the monogamous person isn't being honest with themselves about their desires and how much they're compromising in the process. Um, you know, at the end of the day, just because you're attracted to someone, it doesn't mean that you'll be a good fit, right? Compatibility 
is probably more important than, uh, than chemistry. There's a lot of people that you're going to meet and have a good connection with in your life, but not all of them are going to be um, a good fit. And so, you know, a lot of it is just kind of assessing like, yeah, like, is this, is this a good idea, right? Um, and sometimes, you know, I feel like loving someone is also about accepting um, and wanting what's best for them. And also recognizing if you are not the person who is going to be providing their version of happiness. So, you know, um, if someone genuinely wants to be monogamous, you might really love each other. You might really care for each other. But, you know, if you're not able to provide them what would make them happiest and they're also not able to accept you for who you are and provide you your version of happiness, there is only so far that relationship can go, you know? So not saying it can't work. I'm just saying that there are a lot of risks um, because uh, fundamentally it's a very, very, very different relationship framework. Okay, so um, I hope that helps. <laughs> um, let's have a look at some more questions. Um, okay, so um, Laza Hart asks, um, any pointers for when you are dating someone and neither of you can host for intimate meetups and you can't consistently afford a hotel? Um, okay, so without more information, I can only make guesses of what's going on here. Um, when you say neither of you can host for intimate meetups, do you mean in the sense, like, I'm, I'm just kind of spitballing. I wonder if it's like, uh, do you both live with partners or live with kind of roommates and stuff like that, that make it hard for you to host? Um, because, you know, um, I've like lived with partners before and obviously both of us kind of were seeing other people and kind of how we navigated it at the time was basically I could only host if, um, you know, if my partner was like out of the house or doing something else because it was a small flat, there was one bed and, you know, there was only so much that we could do. Right. Um, but fortunately, like if you have a partner who has like an active social life or was also kind of seeing other people and whatever, then, um, you know, like we could kind of coordinate our schedule such that it's like, oh, you're going to be out on this night. OK, I'm going to organize a date and, my, you know, my other partner could come over and we can have a nice time you know, having some kind of one-on-one -on -one quality time to ourselves. Um, but yeah, like, uh, but there were other times where, you know, simply logistically, it would just would not work. Um, so yeah, like in the past, I have had to uh, stop dating people where the logistics of hosting just did not work out. Like if they, if we couldn't, uh, we couldn't host, um, you know, like neither of our, our partners were going to be like out of our flats for like a consistent evening like anytime soon then you just kind of have to accept that like it's not going to be compatible for the near future so again like i said in the previous question just because you have a good vibe going on doesn't mean that you're going to be compatible there's a lot of things that are going to get in the way um but you know um is there anything that like you can do to create intimacy that isn't necessarily sexual how do you feel about maintaining a, like a connection like that, right? Because uh, some people are able to maintain relationships with like kind of minimal or non-traditional sexual contact and others, you know, don't feel so comfortable with that. So check in with yourself and see kind of whether you can, um, you know, kind of reframe things a little and yeah, like uh, structure your relationship a little bit differently such that you don't, um, you don't necessarily kind of need to have that one-on-one -on -one time for intimate meetups, but this is very individual. Um, but yeah, like uh, if having kind of going to a space like that is really important to you and you live with a partner, then talk to them like about whether you can coordinate schedules, whether they can meet up with friends so you can have that time to yourself one night. And if you can't do that, then, you know, there's only so much that you can do if you can't, if neither of you can host. Um, but yeah, it's about kind of communication with whoever you're living with and kind of finding that privacy. So, um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, Laza. Okay. Um, so let's have a look. Um, <laughs> Dave Leach asks, um, any advice for dealing with one person in a polycule who doesn't get along with the others? It makes it difficult to spend time with a larger community, which is one of my favorite things about poly. Yeah. So, um, you know, here's the thing, right? Like, just like uh, it happens in friend groups, it also happens in polyamorous networks. 
sometimes not everyone vies with each other, right? Like statistically, you know, um, it's pretty likely to happen that like there's going to be one person who, you know, doesn't share like a common interest or like just, I don't know, just is on a different vibe. And that's okay. Um, you know, there are, there's lots of different ways to do polyamory. And uh, some people prefer like a more kitchen table style, which I think is what kind of you're describing here, Dave, um, you know, where you like kind of spending a lot of time like in groups, as well as kind of individual one on one time with your partners. And other people prefer to keep the relationship separate to keep things quite parallel. Obviously, the partners will know about each other's existence, but there isn't necessarily an expectation for everyone to hang out and be besties. So, um, you know, I always encourage people to not force things, right? If people don't vibe, then you don't vibe. You don't need to force someone to come and hang out with you if, you know, you're just not going to have a good time when you're spending time together. Um, you know, so uh, like, and also it highly depends on like why you don't get along. Like, is it like just because you just don't share certain interests or is it because like they're problematic in some way uh, or you have like different political affiliations or something? I don't know. Um, that's making it difficult for you to form like a relationship with them. And then that has bigger implications, right? Like, oh, what does it mean if your partner is kind of dating someone who has certain views that you don't agree with, for example, right? Like, um, is that a conversation that you need to have with your partner? You know, like, so there's, um, basically, this is a very, very broad question. And depending on kind of the individual circumstances, it's very, very difficult for me to give a general answer. But um, I understand that you enjoy kind of spending time in groups, but it has to all happen organically. If someone doesn't vibe with you guys, then, you know, it is what it is. Um, so, um, you know, I would say don't force things and um, just kind of let things like organically like flow as they are. And um, yeah, like sometimes just accept that sometimes people just don't get along with each other and it's okay to set boundaries around that, right? Like maybe um, you, you, you're happy to like respect each other's relationships and uh, be civil to each other, like, at, I don't know, birthday parties, special events, stuff like that. But there isn't necessarily an expectation to hang out regularly. And that's okay. You know, like I have partners who I hang out with like every week, right? Like me, my boyfriend, my equipotonic partner and her husband, like the four of us, we hang out like about once a week. And that's something that we've dedicated to doing. I have some other partners um, who, you know, like I've introduced to this group, of the, my, my polycule. I have partners who have never met my other partners. And I also, you know, my partners also have other partners. Some of them I know and some of them I've never met. Some of them I've met once. And that's okay. Like, you know, I think there needs to be a lot of flexib uh, flexibility and fluidity around these things. I think it's very difficult to kind of force a dynamic. And it does start getting a bit, um, you know, sensitive if you're in a position where you're like if you want to date me then you need to be like like besties with like everyone that I'm dating I think that can be very hard to control and also puts a lot of pressure on people so um yeah basically just try and be flexible about it and just let things like just organically form um I hope that I hope that makes sense so um okay let's uh move on um <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm, I'm just noticing as well that we're coming to the halfway point. And so just a friendly reminder that I'm only here for an hour. So I've got like uh, just over half an hour to go. And after that, I will be jumping on the field app, um, you know, in, and joining the group chat to, yeah, continue the discussion. So if you want to ask me more questions and if you want to talk to some other people about non-monogamy um, and, yeah, just, you know, connect with some other people in the group chat, then the group chat link is in the um, in the chat. So, um, yeah, I'm already on there. And, um, yeah, you can join me and a bunch of other lovely people as well. So I'm going to be answering questions for another half hour and then I'll see you for another hour um, in the group chat. And after that, I'll be getting on with the rest of my evening. <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, get, uh, get on with some more questions. Um, let's have a look. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so Emily asks, any advice for coping with the anxiety of knowing your partner is with someone else and not knowing when you'll see or hear from them again? So 
Um, it really depends on why you're experiencing this anxiety. So, um, you know, if it, like, are you worried that you won't see and hear from them again in the sense that you're worried about their safety? Or are you worried about not knowing when you'll see and hear from them again? Because like, you know, like if they don't hear from them, you feel that it means they don't care about you or that they've forgotten about you or something along those lines. So um, as with anything, like if you're feeling some type of emotion, I really encourage you to dig deep into like what you're worried about happening. Is it like, oh, I'm really worried that like they've been kidnapped or something somewhere and I need uh, just to know where they are and that they're safe? Or is it like, I really need reassurance um, that they still love me even though they're spending this time with this other person or it could be, I need to know whether I'm going to be putting the kids to bed alone or whether they're going to be home by, by a certain time. Uh, and if they can let me know so I can plan the rest of my evening, right? Could be so many different reasons you could be experiencing this anxiety. So I'm just kind of spitballing here about all the possible reasons it could be, which might not be applicable to your individual situation. Um, but I said all of that to show you like, yeah, it, you know, you need to dig deep into like your specific anxiety, right? Like, why are you worried about this? And then from there, you can you can make requests to specific things, right? If you're worried about your partner's safety, then it's like, okay, can you let me know if you change locations? So, you know, you know, or to like check in with me every, I don't know, couple of hours or whatever, um, or let me know before midnight if you're gonna be home or, you know, whatever it is that you need to know um, to know that they're safe. Um, or if you're, if you, you need it, you need kind of some more, some more information for like logistical reasons, right? Like if you've got like a routine before bed or something like that, then you can ask that, right? Like, it's like, okay, um, you know, I want to start winding down at around like, I don't know, 10 PM, like, will you be home by X time? So then we can, you know, wind down together or will I just kind of do that alone? Right. Let me know so I can plan my evening. Um, you know, like there's there's a lot of different conversations that like you can have with your partner to accommodate this. Um, actually, um, I have an article on the Field blog. Um, if the person not from Field could please put this in the chat. <laughs> um, so it's an article called uh, "My pa My Partner Is on a Date." Help, um, which I wrote a while back, um, and basically the article covers um you know what to do before during and after your partner is on a date so um if you want kind of more specific advice on the conversations that you can have before during and after um you know if you're, you're experiencing a lot of anxiety about your partner going on a date that article is probably going to be super relevant to you um so yeah um if the personal field could please find that um that article uh, my partner is on a date help and put it in the chat that would be really, really helpful to Emily right here. Um, I'll let them do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So, but but yeah, um, you know, it's normal to experience this uh, anxiety, right? Like it, uh, like it happens. And um, I think a lot of, uh, there's this misconception that if you're doing non-monogamy, you need to be like perfect at it from the get go. And if you're feeling negative emotions, I mean, you're not cut out for it or whatever. Not true. You know, there's lots of, oh, thank you for putting the article. Um, so um, there's lots of different ways um, you can handle jealousy and it can be uh, caused by like any number of reasons. The, it, you know, this, the, it's, it's not, it, there's nothing wrong with you for experiencing negative emotions. It's more about what you do with those emotions and what you learn from them for next time. Okay. Um, so let's move on. Um, we're doing good for time. Um, let's have a look. <laughs> Um, oh, okay, really good question from Lewis Doran. Is there a sensible limit to the number of partners or relationships that one person can maintain? Um, so, yep, so if the question could come up, please. Is there a sensible limit to the number of partners or relationships one person can maintain by Lewis Doran? Thank you. Um, so, um, this differs from person to person, right? At the end of the day, we all have 24 hours and, you know, seven days in a week. And we all spend them in different ways, right? Depending on like what, you know, commitments you have, like, right? Do you work a nine to five? Do you like run your own business? Uh, do you have family members to look after? Do you have kids, right? All of these factor into how much time you have to date. And then beyond that, how much time do you want to spend on uh, dating and each of your partners? 
Are you interested in having like multiple partners who you see like very infrequently? Maybe one or two partners that you see more frequently and then other people like on the side? Or do you want to invest like most if not all of your free time onto like a very small number of partners? Um, so, you know, um, I would say in general from what I've seen in my experience, um, the vast majority of polyamorous people that I know um, have maybe two or three like serious partnerships maximum like and by serious I mean like you know like high investment romantic connections like you see them very frequently like you might be building towards a future with these people etc two or three um, is kind of what I've seen um and then kind of beyond that they might have some casual connections some long distance connections like some friends like whatever like you know um and um yeah kind of so that's that's what i've seen but you know um when i was like exclusively casually dating for like a period of time when i was just like living my best single life <laughs> um a couple of years back i had like i don't know like seven friends with benefits um and i had them on like a schedule <laughs> like i was seeing like these seven different people um you know i'd see each of them maybe like once every two to three weeks um so you know there are lots of different ways that you could be doing this basically depending on how much time you want to invest in each person and what are the commitments that you have um so yeah like if you have kids if you have a job if you travel often you know that's gonna really cut into the amount of time that you have to date and you have to be really realistic with yourself about that um you know it like non-monogamy does take time does take a lot of organization um, and I think also it's about, you know, finding the right partners um, that are kind of compatible with your capacity, right? For example, if you, um, hypothetically, if you have a spouse and kids um, and, you know, yeah, you so you have all those commitments and a busy job and whatever, and you have like maximum time to see one other person once a week, right? Hypothetically. And, um, you know, you meet someone who's like, I'm really looking for like a person who I can like see like all the time to like, like, like to like travel whenever we want to like, you know, go to all of these events and stuff. You might not be compatible, you know, because <laughs> um, I don't have kids. But from what I know, you know, they're very demanding on your schedule. Um, and yeah, like, you know, if if you just look at your capacity and you're like, I can't give you that, you know. Um, again, like I said earlier, just because you vibe with someone, it doesn't mean that you have to date. It doesn't mean that you can date, and that's okay. So to answer your question, Lewis, um, in terms of a sensible limit, the sensible limit depends on your own capacity, your own kind of amount of time, and how you want to structure your relationships with different people, and how much you want to invest in each of your connections. So um, yeah, the, there isn't a strict number, basically. So I hope that helps. Okay, um, let's have a look. Okay, we've still got we still got about twenty minutes. Um, um, okay, so actually, I want to expand on what I said earlier about jealousy. So I'm gonna move up and go to a question that was actually asked quite early on um, from Katie Ford, um, which is, "Do you ever feel jealousy, and how do you deal with those emotions?" Um, so yeah, Katie Ford. So, um, yes. <laughs> um, so like I said earlier, there's a misconception that like you, you know, that non-monogamous people like don't or shouldn't experience jealousy. Not the case. And I think that's a very harmful narrative. Um, you know, um, jealousy and, and like, uh, not experiencing it or whatever, um, is not a prerequisite to practicing non-monogamy. There are plenty of non-monogamous people I know who experience a lot of jealousy, but they just know how to deal with it. And I've also met a lot of monogamous people who don't experience that much jealousy at all. So, uh, you know, obviously if you experience less jealousy, you're probably gonna have an easier time of non-monogamy, but um, it's it's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't mean that the door is closed to you, right? Like if you experience a lot of triggers and stuff. Okay, so um, yeah. Yes, to the first part of the question, do I feel jealousy? And how do I deal with those emotions? Um, depends on the circumstances, right? Because jealousy can come from uh, like a wide variety of sources. I try to uh, kind of separate it out into internal causes and external causes. So what I mean by that 
is uh, internal causes would be stuff like your insecurities, your trauma, your triggers. So for example, if you have a fear of abandonment um, and every time your partner goes on a date, you think that this means that they're gonna leave you and you're really anxious and you fantasize about like them like telling you that you're not good enough and stuff, then you know that's your own stuff that you probably need to interrogate and work on, right? And where does that come from? You know, where, who made you feel that way? Was it your caregivers? Was it a friend? Was it an ex-partner, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do the work to process. And then there's external causes. Like, is there a need that's not being met? For example, if you, uh, if you used to spend, I don't know, three days a week with your partner and then they, they started dating someone new and now you barely see them once a month, obviously you would feel some type of upset about that, right? Like, I, I think, you know, most people would feel quite hurt by that if they were like, oh, well, now you're seeing this new person, this shiny new thing, and now you're not committing to like our regular meetups anymore. And I feel really upset about that. What does this mean? Um, you know, then it'd be like, yeah, like I have a need for quality time. I have a need for consistency. Is that not being met? Have a conversation with your partner. So that's what I mean by external causes. Um, so yeah, like it could be something to do with yourself. It could be something to do with your relationship or it could even be something to do with your partner. If you're feeling jealous and your partner is just kind of like, um, you know, you're not, you're like, you're not good enough. Uh, like, why are you bothering me with all of these, these complicated emotions? You're being so emotional. You're being so dramatic and really just invalidating you at every step of the way. That's not a fun time. Um, so sometimes it's also about like the person that you're with and how supportive they are and how much they listen to you and kind of what's going on with you and trying to uh, try and get to the bottom of what's going on. So yeah, um, in terms of how to deal with those emotions, there's a bunch of different ways that you could go about it. Um, part of it is, um, you know, looking inside yourself and figuring out what's going on. And part of it is looking around at your environment, like what's changed very recently? It, what needs do you have that you, that you would like to have met? What conversations can you have with your partner? What can you request from them? Um, you know, are you compatible? You know, can your partner realistically meet your needs? Can they give you what you need, right? Or, you know, might this relationship have to change or end in order for you to feel more comfortable? So, um, yeah, um, you know, jealousy can be caused by so much stuff. And uh, so that's why I think it's a really important tool to learn from rather than something to run away from and pretend that you're not feeling. Because if you feel a lot of shame and guilt around jealousy, and you just feel bad around feeling bad, that's not really gonna help you at all <laughs> because you just end up uh, being in an emotional spiral and not really getting to the root of the issue. So um, yeah, um, I, I, hope that, I hope that that helps. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's look through questions again. Um, oh, there's a question here from, um, oh wait, Oh, I lost track. Oh, there we go. Uh, here's a question from um, Adam Flynn Emery, uh, which was asked earlier on in the stream. Um, uh, and he asks, or they ask, um, is there such a thing as a primary partnership or should polyamory be equal emotional or sexual attention across the board? So I think the first thing to put out there is that there are no shoulds to polyamory. Um, as long as everyone is enthusiastically consenting and no one's getting hurt, you can do whatever the hell you want, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, it's a choose your own adventure. So um, is there such a thing as a primary partnership? Sure, if a primary partnership is something that you want in your relationship, but doesn't have to be. Um, and sh should polyamory be equal emotional or sexual attention across the board? Um, it can be in some relationships, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> That's the simple way to answer that question. But in order to um, answer it in a more complex way. Okay, so some polyamorous relationships are hierarchical and others are not. Um, and the trouble with this is that different people define hierarchy differently. Um, so some people just define hierarchy in the sense of, oh, we're married. Oh, we live together. Oh, we have kids. And therefore they take priority in terms of like those realms. Um, whereas other people define hierarchy as like, oh, we're together and, you know, uh, we can do all the things that you can do in a relationship, but we're only allowed to have sex, but not fall in love with other people or other partners that we date aren't allowed to sleep over or, you know, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we're not out as polyamorous and we will never, 
uh, you know, intro- introduce our other partners to our friends or our family or whatever. They have to be kept secret or whatever. Like lots of people set different rules about it. Um, you know, um, I personally don't really subscribe to like a hierarchical model. Like I prefer for my relationships to like take the course that, um, you know, I want them to take without like external influence from someone who isn't in that relationship. I don't love having one partner try and dictate what I can and can't do with my other partners. Um, but you know, some people want to do that and some people are also consent to that. So, you know, like there's a lot of uh, debate in the polyamorous community about like the ethics of like the second form of hierarchy I mentioned where people set rules on like, yeah, like what you can and can't do and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I feel like that's kind of beyond the scope of this live stream. <laughs> um, so yeah, like there is such a thing as primary partnership in some relationships. I think, you know, if you run into someone who does have like a primary partner, you might want to ask them what that means to them and like what expectations they have in their relationship and what expectations they have of like other connections. Is there anything that's off limits to you or like whatever? Um, and get a, get a better idea of like the place that you can have in their life, right? Because for some people it's like, oh, you know, we're like, you know, we're like, we have kids, obviously I have responsibility to my kids which is fair enough. Um, and other people might be like, oh, uh, you know, like we, we have kids. And because of that, um, you know, like if my, if my spouse doesn't like someone that I'm dating, they get to decide uh, to force me, force me to break up with them. And then you in that position would be like, hmm, do I want to be with someone who is happy consenting to someone else, like breaking up our relationship at any time? That's your individual decision. Um, so, uh, as to kind of your second question, it was like, should polyamory be equal emotional sexual attention across the board? Not necessarily, because not everyone wants that. For example, if I had a partner who was an introvert and another person who was an extrovert, if I gave them equal emotional or sexual attention, one of them is probably not going to be that happy about it, because <laughs> one of them is probably going to have a lot more social energy than the other. Um, so I don't think you should be treating your partners equally. You should be treating your partners how you, they want to be treated, right? Um, just like with your friends. Um, so yeah, like it's okay to have different relationships with different people. I think it's just about having those conversations with them about like what they need from you specifically. If one of them's like, Hey, um, I have loads of time. I want to spend like lots of time with you. And another person is like, Oh, I only have time for like, you know, one date every two weeks or whatever. Then obviously you're going to respect that and be, you know, and act differently in those relationships. Right. Again, it's all about communication. So um, so back to my earlier point, there are no shoulds in polyamory. You just need to negotiate and you need to be aware of the risks that you're taking on or that you're making other people take on and um, be aware of the power dynamics involved um, when it comes to um, navigating these complex dynamics. So um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, so, okay, I'm looking at the time. We've got about 13 minutes left of this stream. Friendly reminder once again that I will be uh, answering more questions in the group chat. So if you want to join me and other people, then um, please join the, the 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 group chat for this live stream, um, and the link to that will be in the live chat. Um, so that it's on the field app, and there are a bunch of people who are already on there. So um, yeah, we can continue the discussion there. Okay, um, let's have a look and see if there are more questions. Do, 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 do. <laughs> um. Okay, um, so Moosh asks, um, any advice for people who want to have multiple partners but find it difficult to build close relationships, um, especially neurodivergent folks? I feel like I just have lots of acquaintances. Um, so really interesting question, Moose. Thank you. Um, so I'm neurodivergent. Um, I was diagnosed um, autistic when I was uh, when I was uh, five years old, and I was also diagnosed with ADHD last year. Um, so um, I've had my own kind of struggles with <laughs> socializing, um, and uh, especially because like I don't kind of like come across as autistic or whatever. Like when I first meet people, so a lot of people don't um, you know understand this invisible disability. 
Um, but yeah, like I understand where you're coming from. It can be hard to connect with other people. You can have like, you know, you might have rejection sensitivity if you have ADHD and be very sensitive and kind of misinterpret people. Um, you know, you might miss social cues if you're autistic, right? There's a lot of different barriers that neurodivergent folks have to finding, you know, to, to like finding connections and connecting with each other. What has really helped me though um is um honestly finding other neurodivergent people <laughs> and um the really nice thing about the non-monogamous community is that there are a ton of neurodivergent people in the non-monogamous community like this uh, there isn't that much research out on this yet but there is a huge link um between neurodivergence and polyamory particularly adhd and polyamory um so you know, like, I think that oftentimes it's not that we're so much kind of struggling with social interaction is that we operate socially in a different way. And once you're interacting with other neurodivergent folks, you'll find that you're on the same wavelength. And oftentimes you can understand each other a lot better than you think. So, um, you know, like if you're having trouble, like building close relationships with people, perhaps it's just, you're not on the same wavelength with them. Um, and, um, you know, I would really kind of like get to get, get to the heart of like, you know, why you like what what does like a close relationship look like to you? Right. Like what what are you uh, what are you looking for uh, and what would have and, and where are you now and where would you like things to be and what would have to change in order to like, you know, get to the place where you want to be. Right. Is social anxiety holding you back? Um, is it like, you know, like uh, rejection sensitivity? Is it like, you know, um, maybe you're meeting people who like to go out a lot to clubs and stuff and you don't like clubbing. So you don't share that interest because you get overwhelmed. Like, I don't know. I'm spitballing. Like it could be it could be a bunch of different things that are holding you back from finding the connections that you want. Um, but also, you know, like uh, sometimes it could just be you're looking in the wrong places. Um, and you know, dating is a, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a fun, complex world, right? Like, uh, you, you'll meet a lot of people that you might not end up vibing with, and it's a bit of a lottery. Um, and that's kind of what makes it fun sometimes. Um, but yeah, like, if you find yourself in a position where, you know, you're not really kind of progressing in the way that you want with the people around you, then, you know, um, maybe it's something uh, like that you're doing that's holding you back. Or maybe, you know, that's just kind of where, that person is comfortable being like with you. Maybe that's a dynamic that feels best to them and escalating it further would not feel natural. Um, like I, I think one of the one of the hardest lessons I learned, well, not one of the hardest, but you know, one of the many hard lessons I had to learn about socializing um, is that spending more time with someone doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll be you'll get closer. Like sometimes you can spend loads of time with someone and you'll still be at the same closest enough level just because of the way that you vibe. And sometimes you can meet someone and not spend that much time together but connect like instantly so it doesn't really correlate um it's not like a you know i had to learn it's not like a video game where if you spend x amount of time with them then you level up your friendship unfortunately it doesn't work that way <laughs> um you would i i'm i'm too embarrassed to admit how long ago i discovered this so um yeah um i hope that helps moosh and i hope that uh, there are lots of other kind of uh, audhd people popping up in the chat now being like hey me too um so you're in great company um so yeah like maybe we can talk a lot more about neurodivergence um and non-monogamy um in the group chat um so yeah um we can we can talk more about that there <laughs> um so let's have a look at more questions <laughs> um yeah like yeah so i, I just kind of want to answer that question on like just like uh neurodivergent specifically because because i am neurodivergent there are some people in the chat who are asking questions about like more like chronic disabilities and stuff um which i uh, i you know do not have the lived experience of um but um yeah like there are kind of various uh, chronically ill or poly educators online um you know who very openly talk about how they navigate that so you know um it's just about knowing where to look on instagram and um tiktok or wherever else um okay how much time do you have left seven minutes okay so i probably have uh like one more question <laughs> to answer so uh let's have a look let's have a look <laughs> oh okay um jessica hoff asked uh roughly 20 minutes ago um 
I'm brand new to polyamory and was wondering if you had any recommendations on learning material about the basics of polyamory. Um, so uh, yes, I have loads. And I think this, this is a brilliant question to end on. Um, so yeah, like if you're brand new to polyamory, there's a number of texts that I would recommend. Um, so I think that if you're looking for like a kind of general overview to polyamory and like best practices, what to look out for, stuff like that, um, I really recommend The Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory by Dedica Winston. So The Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory um, is, yeah, despite the title, actually, I think, applicable to people of all genders. And I think that honestly, people who are not women who read that book will learn a lot about the specific um, kind of struggles that some women like go through, you know, in the non-monogamous community in terms of like, yeah, looking out for yourself and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's a really, really good book for everyone to read, if I'll be honest. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I really like that book. Uh, Dedica Winston also hosts the Multi-Amory podcast, which is probably like the number one polyamory podcast there is out there. They have like, like a thousand episodes or something crazy. Um, and they've covered a lot of material um, in, in, their, in their early episodes. So, you know, have a look through that and, um, you know, listen to the stuff that you feel will help you. Um, another book that um, is often recommended in the non-monogamous community is Poly Secure by Jessica Fern. So Poly Secure is a really good book for uh, attachment and non-monogamy. So um, it's written by a therapist um, and it basically talks about attachment theory. So, you know, you might've heard like anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, disorganized attachment, you know, very trendy terms on the internet right now um, and how that relates in a non-monogamous framework. Um, and uh, there are some really, really helpful tips in there, really, really helpful way of framing kind of thinking and like dealing with being in a non-monogamous relationship depending on the, uh, on the attachment style that you experience. Um, so yeah, like people, uh, you know, relationships bring up a lot of attachment wounds. And so getting to know yourself and what your attachment style is, or, you know, even what attachment style shows up with different partners, because that can be different, um, will be really helpful to kind of navigating your uh, non-monogamy. And as far as I know, Jessica Fern just released a new book called Poly Wise to follow up with Poly Secure, which I have not read yet, but I did enjoy Poly Secure. So Poly Wise is probably also a good book. <laughs> Um, and, uh, another book, uh, I recommend is, uh, The Jealousy Workbook by Kathy Labriola. Kathy Labriola has written a number of really good polyamory books. She's written Love and Abundance, which is a more general polyamory 101. Um, she's written The Polyamory Breakup Book, which is specifically about polyamorous breakups. And I think more, most recently she published Polyamorous Elders, which is about what polyamory looks like when you're 65 years old or above. Um, so, uh, really, really interesting texts. Um, but the Jealousy Workbook is probably her most famous book. Um, and it is what it says on the tin, right? Like it is a workbook for you to deal with your jealousy. <laughs> and there are lots of helpful exercises and things to fill in and check boxes and things like that. Um, and a lot of helpful tools for you to process, like both in the moment when you're having a jealousy attack, as well as just like in terms of just ongoing personal work. Um, and I actually narrated the audiobook version of the Jealousy Workbook. So if you look on audible.com and you search uh, the Jealousy Workbook, you will find me on there. I'm the narrator. So if you like my voice, <laughs> you can you can hear you can you can listen to it on there. I also narrated Love and Abundance um, and uh, some other books. But um, yeah, cheeky plug. I'm just going to put in that. <laughs> um, uh, how much time do I have? Um, okay, I also highly recommend um the uh the anxious person's guide to non-monogamy by lola phoenix which came out i think either this year or last year i can't remember but very recently um the anxious person's guide to non-monogamy by lola phoenix um is uh a really really great text it's it's quite short um but it has it's like jam-packed full of like just really insightful gems about hierarchy and um emotions and um, you know, just, just polyamory logistics and stuff. And also just, yeah, as the, it says on the tin, it's the, it, it, if you feel a lot of anxiety, um, it, it, it tells you how to deal with that. Um, and, you know, processing your emotions and stuff. So uh, Lola Phoenix is uh, autistic, like myself. They're also agenda. 
Um, and so, yeah, like to provide like a queer kind of neurodivergent perspective um, on polyamory, I think is really, really valuable. So I would recommend kind of checking um, that book out as well as their podcast, Non-Monogamy Help, which is where Lola just gives, um, d- just does an advice podcast with some reflective questions and stuff like that. So um, that's a, that, that's, that's, that's an overview. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps, Jessica. Um, so um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the live stream. But as I said, you can join me in um, the group chat that I'll be hopping on to immediately after this for the next hour. And if you want to, um, you know, like uh, learn more about non-monogamy in general, um, you can find me online. Um, so um, if I can feel like can remove my question sticker here, um, you will be able to see my Instagram handle. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's my Instagram handle, but I'm also on the same handle on multiple social media platforms. So like um, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter or X or whatever you call it now. Um, I'm on Patreon as well, where I post a lot of bonus content. Um, and finally, I offer peer support. So if you uh, need someone to talk to, um, or you don't have any um, kind of like non-monogamous uh, people in your area who you kind of want to like just share about your struggles with, and you want to talk to someone who gets it, you can talk to me. Um, so you can book some time with me for a peer support session. So I am uh, not a therapist. I am a therapist in training, um, due to qualify sometime in the next couple of years. Um, but in the meantime, like I like uh, talking to people as a peer, um, as a knowledgeable friend, equal, whatever. And that's a service that I offer. I also work with um, couples and groups and I've worked with people from 30 plus countries around the world. Um, so yeah, um, this is where I leave you um, for now anyway. For those of you joining me in the group chat, I will see you there. Um, and thank you again for joining this live stream. Um, I will be speaking again later this month on dating couples. So make sure to um, keep your notifications on and I will see you there. Thank you much. Again. Thank you so much again. See ya.